How's it going everyone? Welcome back to another Groovy DSP lesson. It's been way too long and I do have a couple more lessons lined up about oscillators. This is building up to some pretty interesting stuff. I have a technique where uh, you can make really nice oscillators uh, with uh, not too much theory. Uh, of course, we've got to get through the, the rough stuff first. Uh, and so today I want to talk about table driven oscillators. Because in the first part, we made a saw wave oscillator that was simple, but it did not sound that great. In the second part, we went into why that was, and we showed how to build up a perfect saw wave by adding up a series of sine waves. And this is okay, but you don't want to do it real time. For every sample, you don't want to add, you know, a few dozen or more uh, sine waves to produce your saw or square or whatever. Uh, that's just a no-go. Uh, so what you do is uh, you take these kind of pre-calculated uh, saw waves and square waves and you put them into different tables and you play back different tables depending on what pitch you want to minimize distortion. Uh, okay, so what do we really need to have in our tables? Well, we want every octave to have its own table. Uh, so, you know, uh, well, I don't need to draw this out. It's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you support 10 octaves, you have 10 tables. And you can go for more than that if you want uh, less distortion and more detail or whatever, but uh, this is a good place to start. Uh, so, the question becomes, how do we figure out how many harmonics are, are appropriate for a given table for a given octave? Let's rephrase that question. Uh, we can say instead, or ask instead, starting at a certain pitch, how many multiples of that pitch fit underneath Nyquist? If you remember, that's half the sampling rate. And by the way, if that doesn't sound familiar, please uh, go back and rewatch the last couple of videos because I, I cover those in great detail. And there's some fun stuff in those videos as well. So let, let's just draw this out. So let's assume that Nyquist, let's see, here's, here's our frequencies, that Nyquist is 1000 hertz. Okay. And that's ridiculously low. We're just doing this to make the math nice and easy. Uh, so, if our, let's say our octave st starts at 100 hertz. How many of these multiples of 100 hertz fit beneath 1000? So we have 1, 200 hertz, 300, 400, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Or, yeah, 1000. <laughs> uh, you know. 400, 800, 900, boom. Um, sorry, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a messy writer here. Uh, likewise, if we had starting at 200 hertz, so this is, you know, 10, right, or 9, uh, 200 hertz, you know, we'd have 200, 400, uh, 600, you know, 800. And then that that's pretty much it, right? So that's four harmon four harmonics, and so on. Okay, so you know there's one more consideration, or there's a lot of considerations, but there's another consideration before you go and make your table. Uh, you have to have a table big enough to accommodate these uh, these sine waves that you're going to add up to produce your saw wave or produce your square wave. Uh, and so what you want to remember is that you need at least a positive and a negative uh, to, uh, you know, to produce, uh, hang on, I'm getting messages. Uh, you need a positive and a negative to create a waveform cycle. So that's at least two samples worth, right? One, two. Uh, of course, uh, that's assuming you have a really good interpolation technique and we, we're not going to have that. Uh, it costs a lot of CPU. It probably won't, you know, you probably want a table bigger than that anyway. So you don't want the highest harmonic in the table to butt right up against Nyquist anyway, right? So let's give it a little bit of wiggle room. Let's say we're going to use 128 sample tables in this example. And that's more than enough because you can store a pretty, uh, you know, pretty low frequency in there, right? So 
let's let's go back to looking at you know our 1000 hertz 200 400 600 800 uh one thing i like to do is i like to remove this last harmonic because we're going to be pitching this we're going to be pitching all these up sliding these up to another octave so it's going to go from a bass level of 200 hertz to 400 hertz and these are all going to slide over which means that th this is going to slide right past nyquist and start folding back over and causing that distortion if you let it so if you take this out uh and only have three harmonics uh you don't have to worry about that uh and of course again you're gonna have more than three harmonics three harmonics does not give you a very sharp sound it can be very you know not much different from your initial uh sine wave to be honest um you'll have dozens of harmonics in these um so uh but that's just an example uh, that's why i like to take out the top harmonic okay so uh, here's my table function called init table and it might look pretty complicated, but let me break this down uh, This so let's let's look at first of all my uh, table structures uh, I have this saw table right here where my cursor is uh, and you have uh, One table per octave like I said we have eight octaves if you look up here you know, Okay number of octaves um, it's a two-dimensional array which has so for every octave you have this 128 size table and it's plus one for a reason having to do with interpolation and I'm not going to get to that quite yet. Um, but let's go down here to do a, a knit table. I might just do a short video about linear interpolation just to get that out of the way and maybe touch on some other kinds of interpolation uh, just, to, just to keep the focus on this for now uh, in this video. Um, so for, ugh, I should have used a constant here. This code is not, you know, it's not production code. This is tutorial code. Uh, just so you understand, uh, you know, the best practice here is to use a constant. Uh, but for every octave, um, so from j equals zero until uh, seven, so eight octaves, including zero, the base pitch will be, uh, starting at 16 hertz, which is really low, times this multiplier. And the octave multiplier, if you go down here to the end of the loop, that doubles every time. So it has that mathematical relationship. And, and don't worry too much about the math here. This really is about the principles more than the math. The math you can look up. Um, so we're gonna blank out the saw table that we're about to write over. And while our pitch is under Nyquist, right, half the sampling rate, we're going to add up sine waves. So we get the index, uh, which is from 0 to 1. Uh, it's going to add up to us, add in a sine wave, uh, index times 2 pi, we know which is a full sine, sine wave cycle, times the harmonic, k, divided by the harmonic, because that's the saw wave relationship. You change this, you get, you get, you know, different wave shapes, or if you start skipping or, you know, harmonics or whatever. Uh, because, you know, we learned before in the last video that uh, the sine wave content or the sinusoid content of a wave defines the sound or the timbre. And uh, there you go. Then we skip to the next pitch. Uh, and so now we have one table and then we go to the next octave. And here I write the table out so I can look at it later. Uh, this is debugging stuff. And uh, let's... Let's see what we wrote out, um, just out of curiosity. Here I am in Audacity, which uh, should be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, it's free, little wave editing program. Uh, so you can see that we have this table. We have actually several tables, but it looks continuous in this file that we dumped. And it gets more and more dull or more wiggly or sine wave-like as you get towards the end. Uh, that's because the higher octaves have fewer harmonics, so you can see kind of what removing them visually does here. Um, and you might think, well, this looks like a perfect saw. How's that avoiding aliasing? But if we zoom in on it, we'll find uh, it's it's not quite perfect. There's little wiggles in there. And that's what prevents your, um, your aliasing. And you might notice that, too, that... 
even in these band limited forms, uh, this part is pretty much straight. Uh, and we'll get to a cool technique that kind of exploits that uh, next time. But I just wanted to show you kind of what these waveforms look like up close that we've generated. Uh, so as you get higher and higher, there are fewer and fewer harmonics in the signal, it gets more and more dull, and that prevents that distortion. I've loaded up this sweep we've made, um, well, I've made in this program using these tables, uh, and it starts at a low pitch, and I'm not zooming out, I'm just scrolling, and it ramps up. Um, and we're just playing back the tables using, uh, basically using the oscillator we made in the first uh, video, that really bad sounding one. And we're using that basically because that goes from zero to one and back, or zero to one wrap, zero to one wrap, uh, uh, and we can use that to kind of cycle through the table at our desired speed, as long as we multiply the output by the table size. So instead of going from zero to one, now it's going from zero to 128, which is the size, the size of our table reading through it. And it produces this. Okay, so you might have noticed that it's a bit grainy sounding. Actually, it's really grainy sounding. And why would that be? Well, we're reading out of the table, but some steps get repeated and some steps get skipped over, depending. Uh, it's basically, here's this zoom over here. It's, it's essentially stair-stepping, which is producing a lot of distortion. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but that's exactly what it's doing. It's very jaggy. It's, uh, you can kind of see it here. Uh, so this is kind of a disaster. That's why it's so bad sounding. And by now you're saying, well, I, th I thought you said that uh, using these tables will prevent aliasing. Well, every time it stair steps, we're injecting lots of high frequencies into the signal. These are like miniature square waves uh, that, that we're all putting in. Uh, so the way to fix that is interpolation. Uh, which basically means uh, what we're going to do is draw a straight line between samples. Depending on how close you are from one sample to another, we're going to calculate a height that's a line and basically connect the dots. Um, and that will sound, let's see if I can pull up. Yeah, so it's this one. Okay. Uh, so now we have a sweep, zoom in on that a bit, which is interpolated. So you won't, you won't really see any discontinuities between the samples. But let's hear it. Let's, let's see if there's any, any other issues we can maybe fix. Let me make that a bit bigger here too. Well, you might have noticed that when it goes between the different octaves, sometimes you can kind of hear a little bit of a jump. One thing we can do is we don't just blend between samples, we can also blend between the tables. So as we get higher in the octave, we start fading in uh, the next table and fading out the one that we're currently on. And let's, uh, let's load that up. The works. Okay. It's going to look about the same. You're not going to notice any difference here. But uh, listen to the sound. Listen to how it sounds now. Okay, so that's pretty good. Uh, now there's some other stuff you can do. Uh, for instance, we're fading from one table to another in a straight line, uh, which is, you know, linearly, uh, which is kind of weird. You know, 
you might be able to preserve more of the highs if you fade out the lower table, the the one with the more the more harmonics faster. Uh, you know, you curve it. Uh, but that's one idea. I haven't really played with that, but uh, I think that would work pretty well. You can also uh, have more than one table per octave, uh, which would alleviate this quite a bit too. You know, we have so much memory to throw around. You could have a different uh, cycle per note if you want. And that way you'd only have to ever interplay it if you're doing a note slide. You know, there's some real perks to wavetable oscillators. First of all, we're preventing an aliasing issue. Okay. Uh, you can also stick weird wave shapes in here. It doesn't have to be a square or a saw. You can put piano loops in or whatever you want and play those back. Uh, you know, if you look at, you know, for inspiration, you should check out the ESQ1 or the PPG wave or... But, you know, these have some pretty big limitations as well. Uh, one big limitation is you can't do hard sync. You have experience with analog synths, you might know what I'm talking about. Um, that that's you know if you want to reset the oscillator you're going to cause a click again uh it's going to cause aliasing if you're setting it back to the beginning uh so the question is then is well how do we come up with a technique that can handle that uh the same thing goes with pulse width modulation it's a similar problem where uh you can do it kind of by speeding up and slowing down the table reads but uh, you're kind of you could you could run into aliasing there pretty easily as well um, and, and keep in mind this is only one implementation of a table driven oscillator there's plenty more and there's you know better kinds of interpolation than linear <laughs> for sure uh, and lots of ways to design it uh, just you know so um, next time I'm hoping to cover uh, what's called transition splicing which are, is a really cool trick that's very easy to follow and greatly reduces aliasing. And I'll see you then.